So if anyone has any questions for these two gentlemen, you can walk up to the mics and go ahead. <laughs> Think fast. Hi, this is for Frank. Um, your talk earlier when you were talking about attachment and um, looking at the modern day roles of attachment parenting or the lack of attachment parenting, I just would like to kind of hear your views on what's happened you know, from infancy and beyond with that. As in modern trends yes. in that? Compared to hunter-gatherer, um, you know, wearing our babies in our slings, co-sleeping, et cetera. Right. Well, one trend I can speak to that I've tracked a little bit is related to the it's sort of the pendulum, pendulum effect from the germ theory that really came to the fore in the 19th uh, century. And back then, it was all about, you know, starting with Louis Pasteur and this discovery that pathogens could make us sick and this gradual dawning on the medical community that we had to be cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And by the early 20th century, we got to the point where sterilization, including children's environments, became this obsession, really. And then this idea that children should be raised in their individual cribs, that should be sanitized and basically world-proofed, that led to this, this trend of isolation away from human contact. And the big, the big insight came with the Romanian orphanage story. I, I don't know how many people have tracked that. This is, a, this is a big story in massage school, if you ever go there, where after the, the reign of this particular dictator in Romania, they came in and they discovered that some of the orphanages where the children were so isolated and so neglected and so touch deprived that they failed to develop normally, they failed to thrive. And various cultures are described in these terms as well as being high touch and low touch cultures. American culture is a pretty low touch culture and that's something that we're now starting to see maybe turn around a little bit and I, I would hope. So that's the trend. Hi, my, my question is for Peter. Peter, you painted a very idyllic picture of the children in the hunter-gatherer societies. In our modern world, though, particularly as parenting, we spend a lot of time in conflict resolution amongst the kids themselves. And the kids get into a hassle, Joey bit me in the leg, what am I gonna do about it? What you didn't talk about, though, and I'd love to hear it, is there the same kind of conflict in those societies, and do the parents and hunter-gatherers, are they the conflict resolution agents, or do the children do it amongst themselves? From, from what I've heard from the, uh, from the anthropologists I've talked to, and again, I haven't studied this directly, there's remarkably little conflict. Um, the kids don't fight. <laughs> um, the, um, they, they never go tattling to their parents. <laughs> they never go to their parents to solve, or to other adults to solve, these, solve problems amongst them. Here's what I think, and let me also say that I have also been studying children. In fact, my own empirical research is not in hunter-gatherer cultures. It's in a particular school called the Sudbury Valley School that's 35 miles west of here. It's a school that's been in existence for 45 years now, and it didn't set itself up to model a hunter-gatherer band, but I think in terms of the essential environment for child development, it models a hunter-gatherer band. It's a school, believe it or not, where kids are allowed to play and explore on their own all day long. The kids are age four, which I said in hunter-gatherer bands, it's age four that you have the age of, that you're at the age of reason. From age four on through high school age, and they're all playing together all day long, just like in a hunter-gatherer culture. There's woods there, there's a state park nearby, they can go into the park, there's a pond. There's computers, of course, there's books, there's woodworking equipment, there's the kitchen. This school operates on a per pupil cost of half of what the public school operates. And the learning occurs through play and exploration. Now these kids, there are about 200 kids uh, and about nine or 10 staff members. The kids are not being watched. There's 
no necessity for adults to step in and conflict resolution. What there is, however, that's a little different from a hunter-gatherer band, because there's, in, a, in a some sense, I think you do need to make adjustments. In a hunter-gatherer band, there's a total of about 30 to, to 60 people of whom less than half would be kids, so there's not a lot of kids. Here, you've got a huge number of kids and a relatively small number of adults. What the school has, based on our principles of democracy, is a judicial system. And um, the kids, uh, and there's a, there's a democratic way of making the rules, and the kids make the rules through school meeting, and they enforce the rules through this judicial system. I think, and at this school, I had a, I had a graduate student who spent um, hundreds of days, at, or I should, at least, a, at least 150 days doing observations at the school. And he said the most impressive thing to him was that he didn't see any bullying, he didn't see any real conflict, and when there was conflict, they would resolve it, like an older kid would step in and resolve it. Uh, or it would be resolved through the judicial system. I think that there are several things that about both a hunter-gatherer culture and about the Sudbury Valley School that leads to no bullying. One is they're part of a community that really identifies with one another. In the hunter-gatherer band, they're part of the same band. At Sudbury Valley School, they're part of the same school community, which they value. They feel they own it. They don't feel like they're being forced by law to be there. This is their place. <laughs> so they value the community, and they value the others in the community. Secondly, age mixing is a tremendous factor in all of this. When you put kids who are all the same age together, they become competitive. But age same play is a complete artifact of our school system. It never occurred beforehand. There was never any such thing. <laughs> Kids always played in age mixed groups. And if you're an age, in an age mixed group, what's the point of being competitive? And what's the value in, in, in uh, beating up a littler kid? <laughs> and also what you find is, when you do find anything that verges on bullying, the older kids are very protective. So you have a 11-year-old that seems to be, seems to be bothering a, a, a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old, but a 15-year-old nearby sees it and he says, hey, cut it out, <laughs> you know? And, and there's something about a 15-year-old who's much more effective at that than an adult is, <laughs> because that 11-year-old really wants to be like the 15-year-old. In some sense, you know, adults are too far removed to think that they have any understanding of what it's like to be a kid, but a kid who's just a few years older isn't. So I think that that, I think that plays a role, that we have established a culture, A, in which kids don't have much opportunity to solve their own problems, and so they don't learn how to do it, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We say, hey, see, they can't solve their own problems, so we're gonna have to solve it for them. We get ourselves into that trap. <laughs> so I've probably said enough no, about no, it. No, it's you know. understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Spontaneous comment. <laughs> I'm going to get into that school. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's not a waiting list, and not surprisingly, you know, very few people in our culture believe such a school can work. This school has been going on for 45 years. It's more well documented than any other private school I know of. There are books studied. There are books. I did a study of the graduates and published it in the American Journal of Education. As far as I know, there are no educators who have paid any attention to that argument, to that article. There are books published based on studies of the graduates of the school. There's no question but what this school works, and yet parents are not gonna send their, it's the rare parent who has the courage to send their child to this school because it runs 180 degrees away from the sentiment of our culture. What, a four-year-old is gonna be running around unwatched? Unheard of. I mean, when I was four, not maybe four, but by the time I was five, I could run around all over town. That was in the 1950s. It wasn't so unusual then. But now, 
you know, you might be arrested. You might, you might have your child taken away from you if you let your kid do that, <laughs> you know. This school, it's amazing that this school gets away with it legally at this point, but it does. <laughs> it, it, does ha it has made various compromises to do with the sentiment, but most parents are just not going to do that because they don't trust their children. They don't believe that their child can take care of himself or herself. And they also believe in the myth that if you don't follow the typical resume, if you don't go to grade one, to grade two, you take all the standardized tests, then you're cutting your options short in this culture. You won't be able to go to college, or at least not a good college, and so on and so forth. But this school has proven over and over again that that's not true. Kids who've never taken a course, who just have played and explored, followed their own interests throughout their childhood, have gone on to schools like MIT and so on and so forth. Some of them are professors now. They've gone into every realm. Um, it, you know, we have certain beliefs in our society. Even many people say, well, it's too bad this is true. But it's true, and therefore I've got to send my child. Or teachers who will say this, you know, my job is to get the child into college, and to do that, I've got to get them to get these grades and do well, and this is my job. We, we don't believe that we can be idealists, but we can. We really can. It's not that hopeless. We have, a, we have an amazing society when you think about it. There are all kinds of opportunities to make a living. You know, anybody who has a real skill can find a way to make, if they have a real skill and a real passion, they can find a way to make a living. And the task is to find out what your passion is. But we have a school system that doesn't let people discover their passion because it doesn't give them time. Everybody, the no child left behind attitude, which is just the logical conclusion of what we've been doing all the time, means that everybody's supposed to go down the same path. And, um, you know, and so everybody's being trained as a scholar, whether that's their orientation or not. There are many graduates from the Sudbury Valley School who go on to become craftsmen or artists, and they're not scholars, but they're wonderful in what they do. And there are others who go on to become scholars, but that's because they became passionate about some scholarly subject. The real, the real challenge is not, you know, it's easy to learn stuff when you're interested in it. The real challenge is to find out what you're interested in. <clears throat> What's that? Is the tuition? It's about $7,000 a year for your first child and less after that. Compare that to $15,000 a year that the, that the same town pays uh, per pupil for public school education. So um, this is not expensive education. It's way less than most private schools. You won't find another private school that costs so little. And why is that? It's because you don't need a lot of staff because the kids are learning self-directed and they're learning from other kids and um, when they do go to staff they're getting individual attention around exactly what they want and the staff members are spending zero time on discipline <laughs> and are able because the discipline takes care of itself because of the structure of the school what's that they bring their own lunch. Yeah, there's not a school lunch program. They, there is a kitchen, and uh, a lot of kids are into cooking, and a lot of kids cook their, some, sometimes as a money-making thing, too. The kids who, let's say they're kids who want to buy a certain kind of playground equipment, they'll make money for it by cooking lunch and selling it. <laughs> Can you say again what the name of the school is? The Sudbury Valley School. I'm sorry. Sudbury Valley. Southbury Valley. Sudbury. S U D B U R Y yeah. Valley. Have it's, any of, have any of the students been followed after graduation? And yeah, graduation? and in fact, if you those who are interested, this is the handout that I gave out in my talk. My study of the graduates. Oh, I guess my study isn't listed there, but some of my other research that refers to that study is listed there. If you also look at my blog at Psychology Today called Free to Learn, I have a number of, of uh, discussions of the school. If you look at the school's website, Sudbury Valley School, you will find that there are about 40 other schools throughout the world that are explicitly modeled after Sudbury Valley. Uh, about 25 of them in the United States and the others in other countries. So this is a movement that is, um, that is becoming a worldwide movement. <clears throat> Okay. Hello? Do we have enough time? 
Um, my question's for Frank. Uh, in your talk, you spoke a lot about the need for a more holistic, community-centered approach to our well-being because we are social animals. And I know that a lot of people in the community, myself included, are non-theistic, shall we say. Do you think there's a need for or a place for a sort of secular spirituality in the paleo community? Do we need to figure out a way to practice something that is exterior to ourselves? Or do you think that just basic community stuff will fill that void? I think it's this, I don't think it's something that can or should be imposed upon anyone, but I do think it's something that a lot of people hunger for, and it does have a place. I think it's a human universal to drive towards something larger than ourselves and to experience something that we would describe as spiritual. And it is part of our history. And whether you describe it in terms of brain science or just the desire to reach out into the universe, the I don't think it matters a whole lot. And it could range even from uh, environmentalism and ecology being a way to access something larger than ourselves. I think that has a place all the way to traditional disciplines and traditional religions. I, I think it all can fit. So it's a, it's a hunger we have. Thank you. I guess we're uh, done with questions, and so as soon as we get the text set up for our next talk, we'll uh, begin with Nora Gedgaudis.